No, may I help you? Can you hear me now? Yes. Excellent. Okay, so um, my name is Lisa Long. I'm the VP of Innovation and Product Governance at Telenor. It's about a 36,000 person company that operates in 12 different markets, uh, mostly in Southeast Asia. And what my job is, is I work with product managers in all these different markets to understand how to build products for these very different customer bases. Because a rural Bangladeshi farmer does not have that much in common with a hipster in Oslo. So, uh, before I actually got into this adventure of uh, how to reconcile things between Scandinavia and Myanmar, um, I worked at Skype as a product manager. I also co-founded a company called Six to Start. We make a game called Zombies Run. If anybody hates running, I highly recommend Zombies Run. <laughs> so, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, understanding your users. Because when you come from a particular product area, the reality is that you actually have a bunch of information you don't even realize you have, and it messes with the way you can build your product. So, let's get started. You are definitely not your user. So first, we're going to do some time traveling. I'm going to take you back to 2001, and looking at the audience, you were probably quite young at this point in time, so I'll just tell you about this ancient historical time known as 2001. This is when a bunch of different technologies that you take for granted today got their first start. So this may look like a mess, but this is Wikipedia. This started back in 2001. We also had this thing called the iPod. It was amazing. You could take a thousand songs and take it with you everywhere. But unfortunately, 2001 was also marred by the 9-11 attacks in the United States. And what this did to the U.S. is it made it a very kind of nervous place to be. People were really looking for something that was going to make them feel better, that was going to make them you know, latch on to something where they could be heroes. And so that's where this guy came into the scene. His name is Dean Kamen, and at the point in 2001, he was an extremely wealthy, extremely well-known inventor. And the kinds of stuff he had done had actually been pretty groundbreaking. So, things like the auto syringe. This actually allowed diabetics to actually walk around, and their insulin pump would automatically readjust what they needed. He also worked on a portable hemodialysis machine, so people who had kidney fail would actually be able to walk around. He also made this fantastic wheelchair called Freddy Upstairs. Freddy can climb stairs. It's a wheelchair that climbs stairs. But not only does it do that, if you're in the wheelchair, you can stand up. So you can actually look at people eye to eye if they're standing. So this was a great guy for the US to look at and say, hey, he's going to help us have a better world and a better life. And so he told them, OK, I have this great project called Project Ginger, and it's going to change the world. So the media ate it up. This fellow, Steve Kemper, he's a very well-known journalist in the United States, and he got a $250,000 advance to write the book about Project Ginger. John Doerr is a very well-known venture capitalist in Silicon Valley. He said Project Ginger was going to make a billion in sales faster than anything that ever came before it. Steve Jobs, you know, the guy with the iPod, he said that this was going to be more revolutionary than the personal computer. So everyone thought, everyone was so waiting for this great, fabulous invention which was going to make it all better. And so, like, they were so, so excited. So in December 2001, on Good Morning America, which was the most popular TV show at the time, Dean Kamen unveils very proudly his new invention, the Segway. <laughs> well, he was very happy, but most people reacted like the little cable guy in the back. And they were like, that's it? This, this genius inventor just spent a hundred million US dollars building us a scooter? <laughs> And unfortunately, disappointment didn't really cover how bad things were with this. Erica Hall does a good talk on this, where she talks about how the Segway didn't really solve a problem because it doesn't replace your bike, 
doesn't replace walking, it doesn't replace your car, it's too heavy to actually carry upstairs, so you can't commute with it. It was about 50 kilos to lift. So good for a workout, not for every day. But the other problem they had too is that a lot of cities didn't know what to do with this. So the police would you know, see the Segway riders and be like, no, no, you can't be on the sidewalk, you have to be on the road. And then the next policeman would be like, no, no, wait, you have to get off the road, you have to get on the sidewalk. And the next policeman is like, I think that might be a bike. <laughs> so it was terribly confusing. This, this thing that he was convinced was going to save the world, instead it ended up nearly ending one of our presidents. <laughs> and then what was even worse is the fellow who bought the company from Dean Kamen, he actually did end. His scooter went off a cliff and killed him. So this was terrible. I mean, Dean came and really thought he was on to something that was really going to change the world. And he <laughs> thought he was totally preparing for a rocket launch. He told people at the end of 2001, he was expecting to sell 10,000 units a week by the end of 2002. Do you know how many units he actually sold? 30,000 in six years. <laughs> so, what went wrong? How can this guy, who actually spent all this time like, really understanding the problems of the diabetics and the people on hemodialysis and the wheelchair users, how could he completely lose it when it came to like, building this transportation? Well, he had this problem. I'm a genius. <laughs> And then the problem is that he had the ugly baby problem, which is he went out and told a few people and said, do you like my app? Do you like this transport thing? And they said, well, okay, your team came and sure, we like it. And so this is the problem, is he fell in love with his solution. And so he started building for himself. He didn't build for anybody who actually had this problem. He didn't build for people who were trying to commute. They were built for people who were going for enjoyment. Built for people who had limited mobility. He didn't look for any of those things. He was just like, this is some super cool tech. But we can't pick on him too much, because our industry and technology is rife with these examples. So, remember the Microsoft Zoom, the HP Touchpad, Google Wave, Facebook Home? All of these products are made for no existing users. Tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars were spent to fix problems people didn't have. And it's such a waste of resources. So what are we going to do to stop this? Because we're the product managers. We're the ones who signed up for this. I know one of the guys who worked on Google Wave. He is still pretty embarrassed to this day. <laughs> so, like Martin said in his talk, how do we actually do that? How do we attack this when we're product managers? We ask, what's the problem? And I think Commander Oliver Hazard Perry has a very good comment on this. We've met the enemy, and they are ours. <laughs> they are ours? Well, it was 1812, like, English was different then. But I think what he's trying to say is that we're the problem. We product managers are the ones who get caught up in this. We're the ones who actually make the decisions for the products with our teams. And we're the ones who guide them off the rails. Now, partly, this isn't our fault. Our brains made us do it. <laughs> Inside our companies, product managers are expected to be the voice of the customer. But the reality is, is that we're not actually the customer. Even if we use that product every day, day in, day out, we have information about how that product was made, or how it was delivered, or why it's blue, because the CEO is completely psychotic about that shade of blue. <laughs> And this affects how we use the product. So we can't be like our customers, because we don't perceive information the same way that they do. But there is good news. We can actually fix this, but we have to change our process. So here's the part where I'm going to dive into a, like a whole pile of psychology and dry facts and this kind of thing. And I've learned, because I'm an engineer, so I had to go on this whole journey, that people don't like stacks and stacks of dry facts. So I heard that storytelling works really, really well. And um, so I talked to some of the organizers and I asked them about uh, if there are any kind of traditional Ukrainian folk tales that would work really well. 
And um, I was told that this one was actually a really well-known Ukrainian folktale. So everybody's familiar with Game of Thrones? Yes? Um, there are some dragons and things in it? Great. Okay. So we're going to use Game of Thrones to talk about the psychological problems we have as product managers for understanding our clients. So let's start with the brand problem. So Bran is the three-eyed raven of Westeros. He is the all-seeing, all-knowing entity that knows everything that's happening. Guess what? You are the three-eyed <laughs> raven of your product. You know everything about it. And this affects you. Just like it affects Bran in Game of Thrones. He's a little weird. <laughs> And to your customers, as product managers, with all the knowledge you have, you're a little weird. <laughs> so, how does this work exactly? Well, our brains will collect lots of information. They take in all kinds of things. And what they do is, from all this information they gather, they make these models, mental models, for us to get through the day. So here's an example. You walk into a restaurant. On the table, there's a plate, a spoon, and some stuff you haven't seen before on the plate. Mm -hmm. Now, you have enough mental models that you know, oh, okay, I walked into a restaurant, there are a bunch of other tables, people are eating things, they brought me this thing on a plate, I can probably eat this. That is what your mental model tells you. Stuff on plates, spoon, things, I can eat this. Now, the problem is, your brain is lazy. So, what it likes to do is it likes to build these little shortcuts called heuristics, which help it not have to process so much information all the time. And the issue is that the heuristics that you build in your mental models are different than what your customers build. Now the good news is that someone has actually gone out and figured out what all the shortcuts are that people use, and he wrote a book about it. So, Don't Make Me Think by Steve Krug is a great way to start to actually understand what some of the basic heuristics are for everyone. Not just you, not for your section. And also he gives in some good tips about how to actually start testing. Because maybe some of the heuristics your users have aren't actually the standard ones. Now to understand how these heuristics kind of creep into how you do your work, let me give you an example from me back in the day at Skype. So I worked on the emoticon team. Um, I worked with making the big menus for all the different emoticons and any sort of media transfer. And in my world, way back in the day, when I wanted to use an emoticon, I would type in the code. So it would be music, or torbe, or a dog, or a cat. And that was how I rapidly did it. Now, I knew, as the product manager for this, that there were hundreds of icon, uh, emoticons that you could use. And so I almost never went into the menu. And we decided that we wanted to make it easier for our users to actually start using the emoticons. And so we went through and we built the system so that you can actually see all of the emoticons and pick them from a menu. And so when I was doing the testing, of course, I was a good product manager. I went into the menu. I tested different emoticons. But when I went back to my default behavior, I would just type in the codes. Because <laughs> that was faster and it made more sense. And nobody really uses that menu, right? And so one day I was at a friend's house. And we were having a session uh, talking to some people who were abroad. And I was shocked because my friend clicked on the menu and picked an icon. <laughs> and it completely blew my mind. I was like, oh my god, people really use this. <laughs> and so that's the problem we have as product managers. We get into these habits from using our products because we know where this stuff came from. But in order for us to actually see things from different perspectives, we have to have that constant reminder and refresher of how normal people do things. So the thing about heuristics, though, is that they're very insidious because you barely know you're using them. So back to our menu option. So you're in that restaurant, you actually have your plate, your spoon, etc. And then you decide, ooh, you know what? When I was a little kid, every time I ate something with a spoon, I got sick. So now, anytime you see a spoon, instead of thinking like, oh, spoon, food, etc., your brain thinks, ah, poison! But you don't even know this happened. All you know is that suddenly, oh yeah, you know what, I'm not hungry. You make these excuses. And cognitive bias is really nasty because it makes you make these decisions before you even realize it. Okay, I see some blank faces, so I'm going to go back to the storytelling part. Um, in Game of Thrones, there's this guy named Robert Baratheon. 
and he was married to Cersei, and all of his kids were blonde. And this totally made sense to Robert because his entire heuristics were, I'm married to Cersei, we've had all of our kids since we were married, I've had lots of sex with Cersei, so all these kids must be mine. The only problem was, is that actually, none of the kids were his. <laughs> but that's the whole idea, is that his cognitive bias made him think, of course these kids are mine. His wife had other ideas. So there are four main areas of cognitive bias that we're actually going to dive into. This is a fabulous icon. Pick out your phones, take a picture of this, because this is your homework from this lecture. <laughs> you need to go and look up this website, and it talks about the different areas of cognitive bias, and it goes through each individual thing that can actually cause you problems. And this is particularly helpful to actually look into right before you're about to do a user research study, because then you can actually take a look at what your biases would be and try to correct for them as you're actually going through your study. All right, everybody has the photos. Fantastic, share with your friends if you didn't get it. So the four areas we're gonna talk about are remembering experiences, responding quickly, filtering excess information, and filling in missing information. So these are the ways that cognitive biases will trip you up. So the first example we're gonna talk about is pain. So Daniel Kahneman um, went and did an experiment on how people experience pain. So he got some very sadomasochistic volunteers, as far as I can tell, um, to stick their hands in ice buckets for 60 seconds. And then, he said, that's great, you've done it for 60 seconds. Now I want you to come over to this other ice bucket and do it for 90 seconds. And so these volunteers did, but he was very cheeky, because when he put the hand in for 90 seconds, at about the, 30, at the 60 second mark, he then put in a little bit of warm water. And so they actually felt that it was better. So they were, it was still painful, but it wasn't as painful. So then, because Kahneman is a particularly cheeky man, he said, all right, so you've done 60 seconds and you've done 90 seconds. Now it's up to you. Would you like to put your hand in the ice bucket for another 60 seconds? Or would you like to put your hand in the ice bucket for another 90 seconds? And 70% of the respondees said, we want to do 90 seconds. They opted for 30 seconds of additional pain. What is wrong with these people? Anyway, um, so the thing he found is that the end of the experience is what actually impacted their memory. So being in the 90 seconds was better for them because the ending memory was that it was slightly less painful, so it made the whole thing seem less bad. They used this in medical procedures because they found out that the doctors had been optimizing, how can I make this really short? And it may be painful, but at least it's short. But really what they needed to do was say, okay, this may be really painful, but we're going to make the last step be uncomfortable, but not painful. So this was things like colonoscopies, where they stick various instruments up your behind to actually measure things. And what they would do is leave the probe there for a little while longer, and then people actually had less stress and less, um, less pain, as recalled through the actual procedure. So think about this from a product management experience. When your users are actually going through their work introduction flow, if they're going through sign-off, if they're going through typical tasks, what is the last bit teaching them about that experience? Is it particularly horrible? Is it particularly good? I would try to make it as particularly good as you can, because that actually might make the whole thing more delightful, as opposed to more painful. So the next one is going to require a little participation from you. All right, it's about responding quickly. So I'm going to click, and then we're going to see eight words in the slide, and we're all going to read them together. Ready? Go. Silk, 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 silk. Quick, what do cows drink? Milk. No! <laughs> cows drink water. <laughs> I got you. <laughs> so, this is a bias called rhyme as reason. What I have done is I've primed you with a particular word, then an associative thing to get you to say milk. Now, this is the problem with responding really quickly, is that we're easy to anchor, we're easy to actually change, and we're easy to make us forget information that we know. So this is what Daniel Kahneman's book was about when it came to thinking fast and slow. What are the times that we can actually make these quick decisions? And what are the times we actually need to spend more time thinking about what's going on? So as product managers, we face a million decisions a day, right? That's all we do. We walk in and we start deciding things. So 
we need to understand when are the times that we can basically say, yep, this is easy, we can actually make that decision, and if it's not great, we can change it, versus when do we actually spend the time on it. So from there, there are kind of two categories. One is, can you change it easily? So if it's the color of the login button, yeah, go ahead. Change, like, decide quickly. Make it the blue the CEO's obsessed with, no one will care. And if it turns out it's horribly wrong because you got the data and no one clicks the login button, you can go back and change it to green. But when it comes to things like, should we have a login system? Spend more time thinking about the ramifications are, because you can't undo this as easily as just changing the login button color. So when it comes to your decisions, make sure you spend the right amount of time on them. There's no point in agonizing over something you can change quickly, but there's a lot of reason why you want to agonize over stuff that may fundamentally change the direction of your technology stack or your entire company. So the next part is filtering excess information, the ostrich effect, as it's also called. So when there's too much information coming in, our brain will do its best to make sure that we're paying attention to whatever we think is the important stuff for right now. Now, the issue is, is that the ostrich effect means that we tend to discount things that are a bit negative. So if we see things going the happy way, and we just want to believe that it's going to keep going happy, even if there's stuff that looks like it's going to go horribly wrong, we tend to want to discount that. A really good example of this is Rob Stark at the Red Wedding. Sure, Walter Frey, I didn't marry the, doc, the girl that you presented to me. I totally married this other one. And this is going to be a great party that you're throwing for us. Well, it turned out Walter Frey did want to bury the hatchet. He just wanted to bury it in another Stark. So, you need to be careful as a product manager. Um, this is part of the I love me, I love my solution issue, is that when you see things being really positive, you tend to go after those more, and you tend to discount the things that are telling you this isn't actually going to work. Now the last one we're going to talk about is filling in information. So when there's not enough information for you to make a decision, what does that look like? <coughs> so we will travel back to Stanford in 1990, and there was a grad student named Elizabeth Newton who was trying to test how people knew other people knew things. And so she came up with a test involving music. And the way the test worked is there was a group of tappers and a group of guessers. And the tappers would tap out the song, and the guesser had to figure out what the song was. Now, she did the experiment, and it was very interesting, because when she started the experiment, she asked the tappers, well, how, how quickly do you think the, or how, how often do you think the guessers will be right? And the tappers said, oh, easily 50% of the time. The guessers will get it, you know, maybe 50% you know, of the time they'll totally get the song. And so then she went and did the study, and it didn't quite turn out the way she thought. And actually, this is a really easy experiment, so I think we should do it now. So let's go do the curse of knowledge activity. All right, so the first thing is, you need a partner. So go ahead, find who you want to actually do this with. Get friendly, the person next to you. Everybody has your partner? You sorted this out? Excellent. So, partner on the left. People sitting on, let's see, if you're on that side. <laughs> And then you are going to be the tappers, okay? Partner on the right, you're the guesser. All right? So come to terms with your new role as a tapper or a guesser. Okay. Now, guessers, I need you to close your eyes. Everyone cover your eyes, close your eyes. So half the population should have your eyes closed or hidden. Okay? Definitely closed. Tappers, it's your job to make sure they're really closed. All right, now, do not open your eyes, guessers. Keep them closed. Tappers, I need you to raise your hand if you don't know this song. Does everybody know this song? Okay, everybody seems to know this song. Okay, guessers, go ahead and open your eyes. Now, what's going to happen is that tappers, you just told me you know the song, you're going to tap on the arm of your guesser. So, guessers, hold out your arms, brave abandon, and you're going to tap that song. You have 15 seconds to give enough data to the guessers for them to work out what the song is. So, I'll go ahead and start timing you now. Are you ready? Go. 
Are you tapping? <laughs> okay, stop. <laughs> now, guessers. <laughs> Tell your tapper what the song is, okay? Make your guess. Right. Tappers, raise your hand if your guesser got it right. Did any guessers get it right? Anywhere? <laughs> no. Okay. So, surprisingly, these similar results were found at Stanford. About two and a half percent of the people they tested got it right, which I think was actually one person in their entire data sample. So, let's talk about some of the psychological feelings that happened while you were doing this. Tappers, how was it to know what the song was and to have to figure out how to communicate that with your guessers? Was it frustrating? So, frustrating? Everybody frustrated? <laughs> okay, we've got a lot of frustration going on. Guessers, what was it like to have somebody who clearly had a piece of information they were trying to convey <laughs> and then not really understanding what they're on about. <laughs> Confused? How does that feel? Okay. So let's take this back to what you know about your product. So think of it, when you're dealing with your users, you know where everything is in your product. You know what your UI elements mean, you know what that cogwheel is, you know what that weird swoopy thing is, you know why the elements are where they are, you know what the words in your product mean. All these things that are in your head that for you, looking at your customers, you're like, how can you not know this? <laughs> it's called the curse of knowledge. So, just think of how your users feel. Mm -hmm. So in that few moments of confusion that you had, and like, I have no idea what this song is. You can tell the you know, guessers and tappers you want to know. It was called Ganyam Style by Sai, the little horsey one. Yeah. <laughs> so but think of how your users feel. When they're presented with new change, with new information, you've worked for months maybe pulling this stuff together to actually release to them. But they haven't been there every step of the way. So you need to think about how that information is perceived. So, quick recap, brand problem. We know too much. I hope I've been able to prove that to you now, that we know way too much about our products. But here's the scary part, is it's not just our own cognitive brain that is actually making these models and so on, it's the internal processing of the data. We also have an issue with the external processing of data. So the fact that what data is made available to us in our world. So that's a problem too, because as we actually move towards an internet where everything is more and more customized, then we don't see the same views. So we're going to call this one the Cersei problem. So Cersei is part of House of Lannister, and she has a lot of information at her disposal. And she has a couple problems, quite frankly, because she doesn't always make the best use of the information that she has available to her. And there are kind of two areas where I think she kind of fails on this. One, she doesn't understand that because she has some information, other people don't have the same information, or the same beliefs. And the second area she fails in is understanding that not everybody has the same information. So let's talk about the first one. This is the Sally Ann cartoon. Um, this is from Baron Cohen, Frisk, and Leslie from 1985. And it's testing something called theory of mind. The way this cartoon works is you have Sally and Ann, and there's a basket and a box. So Sally takes her ball and puts it into the basket. And then Sally leaves. Ann goes and takes the, the ball out of the basket and puts it into the box. Then Ann leaves. Sally comes back in. The question is, where does Sally look for the ball? Now, if you have theory of mind, you understand that Sally doesn't have the same information you do. So Sally doesn't know that the ball was moved from the basket to the box, so Sally will look in the basket for her ball. But if you don't have theory of mind, then the problem is you don't know that the information Sally has is different than what you have. And so you assume that Sally will look in the box. So, the problem for us as product managers is a lot of time, we don't even know the information we have. So, again, we'll head back to Game of Thrones. When Cersei uh, had to send Marcella off to Dorne, the problem was is that Tyrion knew the war was coming. They're both Lannisters, they had the same information, they knew war was coming. 
And Cersei could not accept the fact that the safest thing to do is to send Marcella away. She was convinced that Tyrion actually had some other information or some other um, belief. So this is the problem of theory of mind. She's not accepting or understanding this other perspective that exists, even given the same information. So to give you a more real world example, long ago, I used to do dynamic modeling for cars. And the idea here is that there were lots of different options you had in cars, and you had to make sure that they actually matched and fit together. So as modelers, we knew that there were two different ways that you could actually select things uh, in the models. And one was a persistent selection, so it would actually carry on regardless of what happened. The other one was more of a toggle. So it started and then it may come back out and so on. So we as modelers, when we saw this happening inside the model, we were totally fine. We understood what was happening. But some of our customers would start making their car and then bits of it would disappear and then reappear. And this is a very worrying thing for them. They didn't understand why the car was suddenly like not complete or on whole. And we as dynamic modelers like, no, it's totally fine, you're good. So this is a classic example of product managers not doing a very good job of theory of mind because we weren't seeing it from their perspective. We're like, of course you have this information. Of course you know about the different selection states. Why? That was horrible user experience for us. It was one of my stupidest fails. We fixed the UI, it got better. So, but let's say that, you know, Cersei maybe has an ability to do theory of mind, she just doesn't want to. She definitely, definitely has a problem with filter bubble. Filter bubble is a concept introduced by Eli Pariser in his 2011 TED Talk and in his book. And the whole idea about this is that with the internet the way it's going, so the Google, the Facebook, Amazon, they keep filtering our information based on what we read, what we like, what we shop for, and so it means we have a more and more customized view of what's going on in the web. And this customized view is based on everything we like, so it's much, much less likely we're ever going to encounter an opinion or a thing that's like outside of our experience because we only want to be presented with what we like. Now this creates a real problem because if you decide to create your own filter bubble, you may have no awareness of actually what's going on around you. And in the case of Cersei, she decided that when the religious people came on and they said, oh, you know what, we're totally religious, we're fine, we're gonna stay in this corner. And she said, oh, of course you will, that's great. And she didn't really pay attention to how much power they were doing. She just ignored the information. She made her own little filter bubble that I'm perfectly safe. And of course, as we know, things did not turn out so well for her when the actual religious came back and decided that they were going to exercise some of the power that Cersei had been ignoring. In a more real world example, this is Caleb Jones's visualization of the political blogs before the 2004 US election. And each dot is a blog, either liberal or conservative, and the line is a link between the blogs. So as you can see, this is really separated. So if you go to a liberal blog or a conservative blog, any of the links that are available on that page are only just gonna keep reinforcing this echo chamber of information. It's extremely unlikely that you're actually going to hit a link that's gonna take you to an opposing viewpoint. And even if it does, look, there's only like one link. And so it may be the only thing you see. And there may not be another link that actually shows you any more of what's actually happening over here. So as product managers, this can be really dangerous because we then live in our tech crunch bubbles and our tech EU and we don't see the things that other people are seeing from their news sites. And this can have real ramifications. So in Eli Pariser's talk, he actually talked about his two friends, Scott and Daniel. Scott was a political activist. And so when he did a search for Egypt, he actually got all the information on the protests happening in Egypt. Daniel, on the other hand, was a traveler. He liked to visit new countries. So his search results were all about wonderful deals to Egypt. I bet it was really cheap to travel there. <laughs> but here's the problem. If Daniel plans a vacation to Egypt in the middle of the Arab Spring, then he's going to be ending up in a situation like this, unaware that this was actually going to happen, calling his embassy, asking for an extraction. So filter bubble is really insidious. And this is the problem. This is why we can't be our users. This is why we can't represent them, because our brains won't let us. From the internal modeling of the brand problem to the external data that we're receiving just isn't the same. But the good news is there are twittering birds that are coming to our rescue. 
Lord Varus has the solution. So, Lord Varus has the best spy network on both sides of the narrow sea. He has all the right information at the right time from the right people to be able to make the right decisions so he can carry on having his entire power network. And so, this is what you need to do, is learn from Lord Varus. So the first part is, you need to talk to your network. So right now, user research or talking to your customers may be something that you do once a quarter. You need to embed this into your system. So every other week, you need to have an afternoon or an evening where your customers come in, or you go to your customers and see how they're doing things. <coughs> talk to them on a regular basis. And like Martin was saying before, open-ended questions. What are you trying to do? Why are you trying to do that? How does that work? Do you like it? So understanding this will help you start establishing talking to your network as a regular thing inside your product. The next thing you need to do is you need to treat them well. So sometimes our customers are perfectly happy that for an hour we give them a pair of socks or a t-shirt or a hoodie, but there are going to be times when you're going to need more of their time. It's going to be a half-day workshop or a day or you need a diary study, something they're going to have to do over time. Make sure you treat them well. Compensate them appropriately for the time that they're spending helping you build your product. Because the more you treat them well, this is your 1%. These are the people who are going to go out and talk about your product and your company and how, they, how you've treated them. And what you need them to do is you need them to actually convert their friends to users so that you can extend your network. Because it's not good enough to just have the users that you've always used to do your user research. I mean, it's fantastic for a lot of to studies. But what you really need is a constant flow of fresh people that you can actually talk to and make sure that they're seeing the product the same way. And this also should happen naturally as your product gets more and more of a user base. And lastly, once you've had this fantastic network of users who love you and think you're wonderful, you need to spend more time understanding their lives. Because your product exists as a part in a bigger context. And so you need to understand what that context is to understand why the value your product gives is something that your customers are willing to spend the time on. And to understand your customers' lives, it's not enough to kind of sit down with them at the pub and have a pint and say, okay, you know, this is great, how's it working? Find out what they do. So if you're in an entertainment company and you know that people watch movies, find out more about how they watch movies. Oh, do you go to a movie theater? Do you go with your friends? Do you eat popcorn? Do you do it on Tuesday afternoons? And then take your team to mimic that activity so that you can see what it's like for your users when they go with their friends on a Tuesday afternoon to watch a movie and eat popcorn. Because this is the way that you can start seeing the external data that your customers might see because they engage in activities in this particular way. And it may be something you've never seen before because you've never played polo, or you've never gone to a child's uh, Barnhaga, sorry, it's a kindergarten in a region. So understand how your product fits in, and then do what you can to mimic what this is, because all this will be needed to pull together to understand how your product fits into their lives. So the reason why Boris can actually make this all work is because he's extremely, extremely good at listening. And so this is the thing we're going to do now, is that we all need some practice on listening, so we're going to do a short listening activity. However, you guys have been sitting there for a long time, so I think now everybody can stand up. And stretch! Oh, stretch! Yes, it'll help us be smarter. It'll be good. Blood flow is always nice. Okay. So, you can sit down if you'd like, or you can keep standing as you wish. But you need to find a partner. <laughs> so. So, now that you found your partner, partner on the right, you're our chatty person, you're the talking person. Partner on the left, you're the listener. Okay? Now, here's going to be the challenge. Listeners, you're going to ignore everything the talker tells you. You are going to use all your body language, turn away, cross your arms, look down, play with your phone. Listen to someone, somebody else, but ignore them. <laughs> Talkers, you're going to tell us about your last meal, how great it was. You are going to spend your heart into trying to get that listener to listen to you. Tell us how delicious the food was, how interesting the conversation was, where it was. Okay? 
So I'm going to give you 15 seconds. Go. Okay, great. I saw some epic ignoring. That was really fantastic ignorers. You take the cake for looking away, playing with your phone, absolutely. If I was talking to you, I would definitely have shut down. So, good efforts by the ignorers. And good job talkers, you really were trying to get their attention. So, talkers, how was it being ignored? Do you really enjoy that? Or was it really kind of rubbish? Yeah, okay. Ignoring people, how socially awkward was it? Is it a little strange, or did you like it? Are we all engineers here? I'm an engineer. Sometimes it's really easy. <laughs> okay, so think about that when it comes to your users. When you're actually doing your user research, are you actually spending your time writing your notes, or are you spending time actually engaging with them? So now, let's try being active in your listening. So, listener, pay attention. Turn towards the speaker. Look them in the face. Lean forward. Tilt your head. All these tricks to show that you are really paying attention. Now, talkers, you're going to talk about the weather yesterday. <laughs> so, what did you wear? Was it enjoyable? Um, all those kinds of things. I'm going to give you another 15 seconds. I want to see that things are, you know, I want horrendously attentive people. Like, listeners, you are going to be so into this conversation. It's going to be fascinating. Okay? Go. <laughs> conversation. <laughs> this is excellent practice for you. Just think. It's just now when you get to lunch, you're going to be in great shape. So, talkers, how was it to be paid attention to? Is this a good feeling? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Listeners, how much more energy did it take to pay attention? Yeah. Okay. All right. So, think about how you can be a better listener. Right? So, what are the kinds of things that happened when you were ignoring? What are the kinds of things that happened when you were paying attention? When you were talking, did you actually, you know, how, how did it feel? So, think about this when it comes to your teammates, when it comes to your customers. This is a skill we all can use work on improving. So, there's one more thing that Varus does, and he talks to the leadership. And as we as product managers, one of the things that we need to do is we need to help guide our companies. And what that means is that when we know our customers, when we understand what their behaviors are, and when we predict them, then we're much better able to help our management make decisions, particularly in startup companies, where you may have to pick a particular customer segment over another customer segment. You need to know what the reaction will be. If you're pulling out a feature, if you're doing a particular marketing plan, if you know your users, you can actually convey that information to senior management and make sure that they have a better understanding of what their strategic decisions are doing to actually lead to the ramifications of actually making your company grow or continue. So this is the other one, the fifth Lord Varus tenant. Make sure that you're actually communicating with your senior management about what you know about your customers. So we're nearly at the end, don't worry. <laughs> the final message I really want you to take away is that you're not your user. You can't be. Your brain won't let you. From the fact that internally, your cognitive biases and your heuristics are just completely messy compared to what your customers are, to the fact that the data you're actually processing externally is not the same stuff that your customers see. But it's okay. There are plenty of product managers who are able to make products for people who are completely not like them. Like on my team, there are Norwegians who are designing for rural Bangladeshi farmers. It is possible. But you have to spend the time to understand your customers' lives. So just remember your Lord Tennis Varts. Talk to your network, treat your users well, make sure you build an extensive network to keep replenishing those users you're talking to, and understand your customers' lives. Know what that context is. Alright, so Game of Thrones, last thing. Of all the characters in Game of Thrones that I think are most important for you to really learn about, if you want to be a good product manager, 
go focus on Daenerys. <laughs> she has done a wonderful job of adjusting to culture after culture, understanding, picking on new advisors, understanding who her people are and what she's serving, getting actually that information so that she can be a more efficient ruler. So if you want to be the best product manager in all of the land of Game of Thrones, be Daenerys. <laughs> Thank you very much for your time. Was it, right? It was. And it was personally what I learned is the most important thing for the product manager is tapping somebody's head. <laughs> and I'm usually doing this exercise. Uh, so I believe the others will do the same thing from time to time because we have to. Okay, dear audience, we're looking for your questions. We're running out of time a little, but we can't miss it. Uh, thank you very much. You mentioned you have Norwegian engineers that are developing products for Bangladeshi farmers. I wonder if you personally or somebody from your team have, have physically gone to Bangladesh and if you could share a story or a specific insight that you have gathered. Oh, there are so many. Um, <laughs> so in Bangladesh, for example, uh, we do actually spend a lot of time on plane tickets, getting users to actually go to Bangladesh and work with our uh, telco unit there. So in each one of the countries we operate, we have a telco operation. So when we go to those uh, countries, one of the very first things you realize is the clothes you're wearing. And you can wear Western clothes and it's okay, but one, they don't really function for that environment. So probably one of the first things that my teams have done is the first day we work in the office in our Western clothes, and then that night we all go shopping and get all the Bangladeshi clothes, and then we wear Bangladeshi clothes for the rest of the week. <laughs> so, and that is, uh, it teaches a lot because we have to go shopping. We have to understand sizing. There are many things that we actually learn about how it works to get things done that are very different than walking into a shop in Norway and just buying what's off the rack and off you go. It's not the same experience. Okay, more questions? Okay. Hello. Thank you, Lisa, oh, for the presentation. Uh, I'm just wondering, could you please share with us maybe some advices in terms of creating corporate corporate culture of uh, when we are actually sharing and practicing empathy, also as for our co-workers and also for our customers. Thanks. So one thing I've actually started doing with my team is this thing called fail cake. So just get some people together and get some cake. Cake is very important. <laughs> and what you do is you discuss something you've screwed up and done poorly and what you learned from it. And so we just get a group of people to get, like, so for me, it's my team, so there are about, you know, ten of us. We sit uh, down, and I say, okay, so what we, like, what kind of epic thing have we messed up in the last month or so? And let's talk about, like, what went wrong, and then what have we learned, or what can we change to actually fix that for next time? So that's actually a really good exercise, because, it, one, it requires people to be vulnerable. So <laughs> this works best if you're actually kind of good friends to start with, like if it's only one or two or three of you who actually work together. Um, and I've worked, you know, with my team for six months to get to the point where we could actually do fail cake. So this is not necessarily a thing you can be like, hey, let's just take 20 people, chuck them in a room, give them cake, and they'll share. Like, no. <laughs> uh, but that would be a good way, I think, to start, is just get a few people together and have them start talking about what hasn't worked. All right, one more. Thank you for the speech. My name is Marta, and I also want you to share maybe a little some tips how to make... A Customers sometimes they want some product to look specifically how they want to and you know that this is just not right So maybe some tips how to communicate with them via Skype call hangout etc To show them that truly it would be look something better how to like take the, this is like the part taking part of the technical team yes. this. so um, I have a really fantastic designer and uh, it's taken me a while to get him to do this, but I will make him make ugly things. And we use the ugly things to start people off. We're like, oh, this is our first idea for the design, and it's horrible. It's like, you know, looks disastrous, looks like some you know, blinky lights on it, whatever. And we're like, yeah, this is what our first design is. What do you think? And it makes people have to start criticizing it, because they're like, oh, well, I don't know if we really need Christmas lights on the whole thing. Um, maybe, maybe we need fewer blinky lights. I'm just thinking maybe. So make them, show them something ugly first and it gets them into a critical mode, then show them the thing they want, 
and say, oh, is this really the thing that you want? Really, is that work the way it does? Because on the blinky light version, you really like this, and yet that's not here. And so what it does, it makes them critique the thing that they actually think that they want, and then you can introduce the one that is yours and say, okay, this is what we think, you know, from actually doing the research, etc. this is what we think has actually worked. Yeah, but this is a very common problem. <laughs> Okay, we have, yeah, thank you. So we have room for one more question, and it's going to be that lucky man. First of all, I'd like to thank Lisa for the great speech. So um, I have a question. Uh, how to deal with a customer who thinks uh, that user testing is a waste of time, since he's trying to actually to build the final product? Thanks. So yeah, this is a really common problem inside Telenor too. They want us to ship yesterday. Uh, and so one of the ways that we've had to do this is it's a process. So the thing is, typically if a customer is coming to you and it's already the last minute, um, then you probably can't win on that one. So you're actually negotiating for the next one. You say, okay, that's great. We're going to go ahead and launch this. And you know what? For giggles, we're going to do two days of user research testing just for you. And then show them the results. I'm like, wow, oh, that didn't work out the way you had hoped, had it? Hmm. You know, I bet if we had done this earlier, that might have helped. And so then you can convince them for the next projects. Um, but I, I definitely dealt with that situation myself. We had, a connect, uh, we had a car project, and in the car project they had done no user research, and they had me this application, and I was like, what does this fix? And they're like, it'll be great! And I'm like, no, 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 what does this fix? <laughs> and they're like, well, we haven't actually checked anything with anybody, any humans, we just built this. And so then I said, great. So I forced them to go back and do the user research. And eventually, you know, they understood that this was going to save them a lot more money to do it first before they built things. Good. Okay, Good one more question. Thank you. How <laughs> uh, you mentioned zombies run. I'm very curious how did you uh, get the idea and how did you test that zombies run? So, um, my, so Naomi Alderman is our author for that. And my co-founder, Adrian, had been thinking, we've been thinking about running apps for a long time. So we had actually built some different things that we were um, temp paper prototyping, testing, playing with, etc. cetera, tried to figure out like, how to do mechanics inside an application. And then Naomi went and joined a running club in uh, England. So um, these running clubs, I don't know if you have them here, it's basically like 10 people get together and they all go on a run in like Hampstead Heath or something like that together. Um, so Naomi went to this running club and they asked each person in the running club, why are you here? Like, what are you doing? And so some people said, well, I'm here because I want to lose weight, and no, oh, I'm here because I want to get fit. And then one woman answered, I'm here because when the zombie apocalypse comes, I'm going to outrun all of you. <laughs> <laughs> and Naomi said, oh, that's genius. And so she went home and she called Adrian and she's like, I've got this. <laughs> and so then Adrian and Naomi um, worked out on what the mechanics are. And then over the summertime, what we would do is we were actually using our uh, phones to uh, test like how much can we actually do, and they were kind of running, and they were like running, turning really fast, and playing with bikes and so on, so we could get an understanding of what the technology could do. Um, and then we ran a Kickstarter because we wanted to see like yes, we've done all the testing, we know we can build this, but does anybody care? And through the Kickstarter, that was you know kind of the history making of Six to Start because that was the you know at the time it was the highest amount ever raised by a games company. And it was seventy two thousand dollars US, so obviously things have changed since then. Um, yeah, and that was our market validation that people wanted it, and then we built it. Okay, thank you, and applause to Lisa.